consider that are out there and the different service opportunities and how these service opportunities can serve as a stepping stone to a career. Um, we hope that this webinar is helpful in providing more information about the types of gap year opportunities and types of way people can serve based on their interests and things they want to do. Um, and we also would love to provide real stories and insight from people who have participated in successful gap year programs. Um, I would like to thank our panelists here today and provide um, a brief introduction and then they will be able to introduce themselves. Um, here today we have Tom Noble, who is a 2008 alum. We have Ina, who is a service member recruitment manager for Food Corps. And we have Jennifer, who is a 2006 alumna. So um, I will allow them to, uh, after I'm done speaking, they will go and they will give their presentations. While they are presenting, please feel free to use the Q&A chat box at the bottom of the screen to ask questions. You can feel free to type and ask questions throughout any of the presentations. And after we have gone through all three of the presentations, we will open the floor to a Q&A. So please feel free to ask questions at any time and we will answer them at the end. Um, so thank you again for joining us. And now I'm giving the floor to Tom Noble whenever you're ready. Hi everybody, good morning. Or well, it's morning here, afternoon, wherever you are um, in Los Angeles. Uh, uh, nice to be with you all. Um, I uh, graduated of 2008 class and um, recovering uh, PSC junkie. I uh, was a post participant, post team leader, alternative breaks, uh, a bunch of other, worked in the public service center a little bit. So we were joking with Renee before this, anytime the PSC calls, I am excited. This is the highlight of my quarantine. Um, hope everybody's doing okay. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, on here, I guess, because I'm also an alum of Teach for America. Um, I, uh, you know, was uh, towards the latter part of my experience at Cornell, um, you know, through largely through my experience with the PSC had, to, you know, really decided I wanted to do something in service um, in nonprofit work, hadn't really found like the issue that I was really passionate about. Um, there were Teach for America presentations on campus all the time, you know, uh, at that point, there, you know, 50, 60 people every year that were going to Teach for America. And, it, it didn't click with me my first couple of years. So to anybody who, who's thought about it is not quite sure if it was for them, like I hear you on that. Um, it took uh, I uh, took an experience where I was part of the Urban Scholars Program. I went to New York City summer before my senior year um, and didn't even work directly in education. I worked in a program working for folks coming out of uh, incarceration, but hearing all of those guys uh, talk about the, the way their education system failed them um, and how each of them you know, entered in this like voluntary education program to try to get their GED and how important education one of them. That was the moment that clicked for me. I got back my senior year and immediately like contacted the Teach for America recruiter is like, this is something I, I think I want to do. Um, it so happened that, you know, 2008 was, uh, I, you know, I, I can feel, uh, I can remember the anxiety that I'm sure a lot of you are feeling with, uh, uh, you know, economic uncertainty where lots of my classmates opportunities were kind of peeling apart. Um, uh, because of, um, you know, the, the Great Recession at that point. Um, that's not why I joined Teach for America, but it, you know, it turned out to be a nice thing that, you know, there was a structured program in place. And, you know, rather than relying on, a, um, you know, trying to find opportunities with organizations who are really in flux, like there was some stability with a program there at that point. So I think that's a, you know, maybe an appeal to a, like, you know, a program like this entering um, out of college. Um, uh, so I joined Teach for America. I was, uh, before this, we were joking too, I grew up in upstate New York, so I was ready to get out of there. I put, uh, you get the like preference where you wanted to go. I put all West Coast cities. I ended up in Phoenix, Arizona, which is like the exact opposite of Ithaca and Syracuse where I grew up. Um, so a real shock, uh, both like living there and then like the experience uh, being 22 and starting, um, you know, in a classroom just a couple of weeks after uh, graduation with uh, eighth graders, I taught eighth grade math was like a amazing experience and inc incredibly difficult. I, I say all the time, um, you know, now 10 years removed from that, that I think it will, it will be the hardest job I will ever have. It was also like the easily the most rewarding job I've ever had. Um, 
you know, if you're thinking about education at all, I think there's just some credibility you gain by having some time in the classroom and um, Teach for America, uh, you know, allows an opportunity, um, you know, for those of you who haven't studied education or don't have a degree in education, it's, it's what they call an alternative pathway that allows you uh, a chance to enter the classroom without having studied education. And um, it's incredibly hard, uh, but incredibly impactful. Um, uh, I, I taught eighth grade math for a couple of years um, with, you know, 100 kids a year. Um, you know, had no idea what I was doing, was making up as I go along, trying to use every resource available to me. Um, and we had a lot of wins. A lot of kids, uh, you know, I think did things um, that, um, you know, I was really proud of uh, and put themselves on a different path. And, uh, and you know, uh, a lot of mistakes and things that, man, I go back to all the time, wishing I could do better. Um, I've since, I've been in education my whole career since. And again, that wasn't the plan, but um, I, I stopped teaching after a couple of years and, uh, you know, went to grad school and, and now I work in an education nonprofit uh, based here out of LA. Um, but it was my experience in the classroom that solidified for me. Like there is a huge inequity problem in public education. Um, and I, I want to have a larger impact in that. I'm going to figure out what that means um, and, and do it for the rest of my career. So, um, you know, I think the, the Teach for America's experience kind of kicked me off on a path um, to be able to try to find what that means. And, um, you know, now I get to do that work on a national scale, which is really cool. Okay, thank you so much for sharing. That's really interesting. Um, Ina, if you would like to share next whenever you're ready. Hi everyone, happy Friday. Um, I hope that you all have been doing and doing well and holding up the past couple of months. Um, my name is Ina Tubalaiha and I am the service member recruitment manager at Food Corps. Um, I originally started in the healthcare industry. I was working in the healthcare industry for about five years and I was noticing that a lot of the health inequities that I was observing in the community were a result of the food access inequities. And it was just showing up 20 years later in um, some of the chronic illnesses that the community was, was facing. So I decided to transition my career into the food and agriculture space so that I could you know, help others um, live their healthiest lives possible. Um, through um, what they're eating and challenge how um, food access and how the food system is currently um, distributing food. Um, so here at Food Corps, we believe that um, there is a possibility where our nation has um, the healthiest communities and the healthiest schools possible and children can grow up knowing what healthy food is, how it grows and where it comes from. Um, we're also passionate about creating a generation of leaders with the skills and experience to be able to turn that vision into a reality. Um, we believe that schools are some of the most effective points of intervention and that's where kids spend a majority of their time and, and as we've learned through this pandemic it's, it's sometimes even where they get their, their meals for the day. Um, so what Food Corps has done is we've set up a program of 220 service members and they're placed in schools where um, they are, where they're the most vulnerable and where they get their most calories of the day. Um, so we are targeting those kinds of communities. And our program really focuses on three areas of service where there is hands-on learning, you're spending time directly in the classroom teaching children um, what healthy food is, building school gardens, um, things like that. Um, we're also spending time in the cafeteria every single day and teaching children um, what choice they have in um, creating a healthy school meal. And then the third area of service is building a school-wide culture of health. Um, and making sure that the environment and the community um, is moving towards a space where the food is being grown closer to where it's being consumed um, and that everyone is on the team of building um, the healthiest meals possible for the students. If you have any questions about Food Corps, I'd be happy to take those after um, in the next um, agenda. 
Thank you so much, Ina. That's super interesting. Um, and it seems like a great program. So um, Jennifer, whenever you're ready, you can go next. Thanks, Samantha. Um, good afternoon, everybody. I'm excited to be here. I'm also really excited to be here with Tom and with Ina. Um, Tom and I were post leaders together at Cornell so many years ago. Um, so that was wonderful. And I can give you a little bit more background, but I worked um, at a school that had a Food Corps member. So I feel very connected with um, everyone here. Um, so I was a 2006 graduate from Cornell. I was in human ecology. I majored in human development. Um, and while I was at Cornell, I worked a lot in the PSC, similar to Tom, big post junkie, team leader for several years. Um, some of my best friends came out of post, so, so grateful for that program. And I also did um, reach tutoring in Ithaca, uh, working with some elementary school students. And I think somewhat similar to Tom, like wasn't really sure what I wanted to do next, sort of. I knew I loved working with kids and with families and communities, but didn't know in what capacity I wanted to do that. Um, I'd done, like I said, some tutoring, some work, um, some other volunteer work, some internships in education, but wasn't sure that was exactly my path. Um, so my senior year applied for all kinds of jobs all over the spectrum. <laughs> Um, and ended up with a uh, one-year fellowship at a nonprofit organization, which was is no longer around, um, but did uh, advocacy for pre-K programs. And so trying to expand access and quality for early childhood education programs across the country. And that was a truly wonderful experience. It was, um, like I said, it was just designed as a one-year fellowship. But what was nice about it was that it sort of, I got to dip my toe into something, into the professional world, into policy, into advocacy, um, and just sort of get a taste of it. And the folks that I worked with were wonderful in knowing that this was just a finite thing. And so it also opened up my, um, my network of folks who I had, who I could talk to about career opportunities or what they'd done or how they sort of set upon their path. And that was really helpful for me. Um, as that fellowship was wrapping up, I realized similar to what Tom had said, like if I did want to be in this education space and I loved education and I felt really passionately about it, I wanted to get my feet in a classroom and work with kids and really like I love working with kids that has always brought me so much joy. And so um, joined Teach for America also, was in the DC region, um, taught in DC public schools for a few years. And I've also stayed in the education space. Um, I worked on staff at Teach for America for a little while. I've worked at the New York City DOE. Um, I now work at DC Public Schools. I worked at a charter school. I've been sort of all around the block in different roles. And I will say that one thing that was really helpful for me, having done a few different things fairly quickly after college, was that I did get some perspective on what's out there and what I liked and what I didn't like. And that has really served me well even now, right? So it really did give me sort of this leg up of trying a few different things and understanding myself better and understanding the field better so that I could make more informed decisions as I went through my career. Um, so if you're not 100% sure what you wanna do, I think that's great and that's fine. And there is like no harm, as long as you're passionate and committed to what you're doing in the moment, like try some things out, see what works for you, see what doesn't work for you um, and learn and grow from that experience. Okay, um, thank you so much, Jennifer. That was very insightful um, and I really enjoyed it. I would like to say thank you all for your presentations. Um, we do have some questions, so we are gonna move on to the Q&A section, um, which will be led by Gabrielle. Okay, the first question, I think it's directed to Tom and maybe Jennifer, but what made you decide to participate in Teach for America versus other service corps um, in schools and education. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think the what what Jen just said, like once once I found myself really interested in education, you know, I think smart people um, who 
you know, like, like folks on campus and folks who worked in the field gave a lot of advice that if, if you think you really want to do this, you should go teach. Um, and, and there, you know, no discredit to other avenues into education and, uh, other programs, but, um, you know, it's where you, you get to have like this direct impact right away. There's a tremendous need in a lot of the low income school systems where Teach for America works. Um, and just for uh, gaining, again, like a credibility, just saying you've taught, uh, care, you know, can carry you um, and can open doors for your career. Um, uh, you know, just by saying that I know what it's like to be a teacher, um, having done it a few ways, but uh, a few, for a few years, um, uh, and, and just having, uh, you know, understanding how the system works on the ground. Um, you know, even, even if you're not sure, you don't think like, I'm going to do this for, uh, the rest of my career. First of all, you'd be surprised. And there's lots of folks who went into Teach for America for, uh, expecting it to be a two-year, uh, two-year commitment and they're still teachers or, um, you know, or made, made a career out of it. Uh, but you know, it's, um, it's an opportunity, I think, to to have that direct impact um, in a way that like uh, you, that you don't get from from other ways of working in education. And I would just add on to that. I think I feel like for me, and probably still for Tom, like when we when we were graduating back in the day, I've, there weren't as many alternative certification programs as there are now. So like I agree with Tom, and that I felt like TFA was what would prepare me the best. I think that now there, if you do want to go into teaching. TFA is one route and it's a strong route. And if you want to like jump in and be a lead teacher your first year, go TFA, right? Like that would be my two cents. If you're like, ah, I've never worked with kids. Ah, this makes me a little bit nervous. There are lots of other alternative certification programs where you're placed as like a co-teacher your first year and then become a lead teacher your second year. And so I know lots of folks who, for whom that has felt more comfortable um so like ones like relay does a program like that i know there's lots of local programs like um kip dc does a program like that like there's lots of other programs if you know an area where you want to work i would just start researching some alternative certification programs and you could find lots all right thanks um what does the average day look like for a food court member that's a great question um so usually a typical day for a food court member is they'll spend some time in the morning doing a lesson plan prep um, and then actually being in the classroom with the um, students teaching about a new recipe or doing a taste test. Um, then the food court member typically spends lunchtime in the cafeteria with the students um, just educating on different kinds of food choices. Um, after lunchtime, then the food court member typically can spend some time in the school garden um, if there is one. Um, sometimes not all schools have the space for a school garden. Um, if that's the case, then the uh, food court member will be spending time with the school nutrition staff and thinking about what options are for lunch tomorrow and how they can change some of those options to be a little bit fresher. Thank you. Um, for everyone, if you were still at Cornell, what would you get involved with? Um, what do you think would have helped you succeed in your gap year program and after? Um, I can jump in. I feel like I would get involved in the same things. <laughs> Build confident in what I did. Um, but I think that what was really helpful for me was being able to take on some increased responsibility with some of the work that I was doing, right? So going from being a post participant and just doing some of the volunteer work, which I was wonderful, but to being a team leader and developing some management skills and learning about having tricky conversations and how to set up systems and structures to ensure that things run smoothly, like all of that kind of stuff, having done some of that like project planning and like people management work was really helpful having gone into a professional setting after school where, I mean, I remember like starting the first week of my fellowship and my boss being like, here, I need you to contact these people and get this information. And I was like, ah, <laughs> right. But like having done some of that um, in college, I was like, okay, no, you know how to do this, like make the connection. It's a different context, but it's the same kind of work. And that was really reassuring and helpful to me.
I think that's great advice. I think the le like taking leadership responsibilities. Um, I'm really glad I got those reps my last couple of years at Cornell, the lead programs that you're participant in before so looking for those and then I think like you know if you're thinking about education like try to get in schools they're, they're the PSC I'm sure still has programs where you can um, work with schools you know and this is obviously all you know assuming um, schools are going to open and, and such unfortunately but uh, you know whether it's through the PSC or just you know directly contacting one of the local elementary middle high schools um, they're always looking for volunteers chances to get in classrooms see what it's like work with kids and to Jen's point earlier, like kind of get a sense of like, do you think you like it? It's, it's hard to gauge without actually spending like a decent amount of time. And I wish I had done, you know, for all the service stuff I did, I actually didn't spend that much time in schools um, when I was at Cornell. And that's something I would do differently. Um, I didn't go to Cornell, um, but I would definitely uh, like to echo the things that Jennifer and Tom shared. Um, in my university, I spent a lot of time doing um, leadership, like being a part of leadership organizations and doing volunteer experience. The only thing that I would do differently is I would spend a lot more time spending time with people that weren't like me. Um, I think that what I learned in the professional environment is that it's a lot more collaborative than I thought. Um, so, you know, in your, in your, in my experience, I was spending a lot of time with people in the same major as I was. I was spending a lot of time in the same organizations as the people, you know, I was spending a lot of time with people like me. And I think that the only thing I would do differently is just challenge myself to be more collaborative in people that aren't like me and that don't have the same identities as me because that's something that is a skill um, that I had to develop very quickly um, in my professional experience. How did you balance your finances during a gap year? Do you have any financial tips? I feel like I should be taking financial tips from people. <laughs> I don't know that I have those to give. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I, so I don't have any great answers. I will just acknowledge that if you're somebody who, um, is is coming from you know it, it, the college experience or the way you grew up where you, you don't have a lot of financial stability um they're you know going into the nonprofit sector and and um you know teach for america food corps whatever where um there's not a big salary attached like i'm sure that's a concern right and especially in a time of economic uncertainty um i remember feeling that i grew up in a relatively low-income area and um you know, this like concern about like how much money am I supposed to make after college and how am I going to make this work look was completely unknown. So I don't have any good tips. I, if others do, you should take every resource available to you on financial literacy and how to budget and become an adult. I feel like I'm just figuring that out 10 years later. Uh, I will also acknowledge that like, you know, I, in Phoenix, Arizona, I made something like $32,000 my first year teaching. That seemed like the uh, like an enormous amount of money to me at that time like uh, again like just based on what my circumstances were previously i i that that worked for me uh for for a while um uh, because of where i came from so everybody's situation is different um i know teach for america if you join the program they're very wary of trying to support folks um from low-income areas in the transition they had like grants available where like i was concerned about getting the flight to phoenix and moving across country and i actually got like some financial support to be able to do that to like reduce that barrier um there are things available like that um just to kind of ease the transition into like you know, becoming an adult, getting a paycheck, trying to figure all this stuff out. So no, no big ahas there, but I'll just say like, I, I, I'm, I'm with you if any of that is a concern. I echo Tom. I, I, for my fellowship got, I think it was $30,000 and no health insurance. <laughs> I was like, well, it's more than I've ever made before. <laughs> Seems fine to me. <laughs> but it was, I mean, I think it was, it was to Tom's point, like doing my best with, uh, to make a budget and stick to a budget. And probably also in hindsight, something I would have done differently in college was taken some financial literacy course or something of that nature. Cause I, I do feel like that was a big kick in the pants once I, um, graduated and was trying to juggle more, uh, more financial responsibilities. Um, what was the transition from Teach from America to a full-time job um, or food court? Uh, 
Um, so I can speak a little bit to that. I think I had it somewhat, most people go straight from college into Teach for America, and I did have that one year in between, which I do feel like gave me a little bit of a leg up, not just in TFA, because I sort of had that work experience and was like, oh, I know how an organization works or how a school works, and I have a little bit more context. Um, but also then when I transitioned back into out of a school and into a nonprofit, I sort of had that experience to fall back on. Um, I will say, and I continue to say, like, schools are funny places. <laughs> schools operate <laughs> with some, like, culture and norm. And I've worked in many schools at this point, and they all have their own little quirks, and schools are different from organizations. Um, and so I do think there is like a bit of an adjustment period. And I think there's a lot whenever, I mean, whenever I've switched jobs, yes, I jump in and do things that I know how to do and I feel comfortable with and I have my way of working, but I also do try to be really cognizant to watch and listen and like see how the organization functions and how people function so that I can make sure that I am responsive and um, just in alignment with how things work. Um, so I think that there is, there are many transferable skills. Again, it's like that reminder to myself of like, oh, I need to like backwards plan this project or, oh, I need to organize this group of people to do this things. I've done that. It's just been in a slightly different context. And so helping myself make those connections has been helpful across the board. Uh, what is the training process like, both for Food Court and Teach for America? Um, for Food Court, what we do is we have a very large gathering at, in August every year um, prior to service starting. And this is where we spend a week long together, um, all the staff and all of the Service Corps members. Um, they go through national orientation together. Um, so that we can start sharing the tools that you'll be using throughout your service period. After national orientation, then each service core member spends about another two weeks with their um, local communities, learning about the environment there. Um, so there's about a three week um, training period prior to service starting. Uh, Teach for America has what's called Summer Institute. Um, you know, you, you essentially uh, spend the summer leading up to the school year preparing um, a combination of sort of like, I don't know, the equivalent of like education courses. So like, you know, crash course in um, how, you know, how school systems work and how um, schools operate and a little bit of education policy and kind of the nuts and bolts of why things happen in the classroom though they do plus how you you know learn to create lessons and um and do all the things that a teacher does and then actually teaching um uh and and doing that in a local school um over the course of the summer uh for summer school with lots of like feedback and reinforcement of like you know just practice and reps um to try and figure out like you know what you're doing how to build a lesson how to be in front of the classroom um uh, to try and prepare you for the uh, having your own classroom as a lead teacher in the fall. I think, uh, you know, my perspective is, you know, a lot of people, um, this is a, a critique of Teach for America that like five weeks or whatever it is now is not enough to learn to be a teacher. A hundred percent, it is not. Um, yeah, you know, there are people that uh, go through a very formal education program and um, that's got to be it's got to be much more uh, preparation uh, than than I had and, and make folks feel a lot better than going to the classroom uh, at the same time for five weeks I think it's pretty good I think I think they they go in with an understanding that you are not going to come out of this being an expert and being 100% confident going to the classroom you're going to learn the essentials and you're going to learn a lot of the rest once you get in your own classroom um, on the job and um, uh, you know, so I, I, I think as long as you go in with an uh, understanding that, uh, you, you know, the maybe some people come away feeling completely confident in their classroom. I don't think many do. And I think that's OK, because um, I think the, the job, no matter what pathway you take to get in the job that your first year teaching, almost anybody that's been in the classroom will tell you is the hardest thing you'll ever do um, and just requires, you know, some some time to figure it out, um, regardless of the preparation you have. All that said, I think. Teach for America does as good a job as they can with the, with the Summer Institute program. Thank you. 
Jennifer, how did you find a fellowship? Where did you look to find it? Um, it's a great question. I feel like I think I just found it on like Indeed or something like that. Like I, I just remember literally sitting at my computer for hours just like scrolling through <laughs> job posting boards being like what's a thing that I could apply for um I'm almost certain I just found it like through something like that um one of those sites I also did do a lot of like searching around for different types of programs I knew I wanted to live or I was pretty sure I wanted to live around DC and so I started just like researching DC area nonprofits um, and seeing what opportunities were coming up there from like organizations were popping up in a bunch of different lists. And then I would go and look at their job postings and see what was available. Are there any specific requirements for Food Corps? Are, there, are they only for postgrads or can students in school right now apply? Um, that's a great question. The only requirements that we have for Food Corps Service Corps members is you have to be 18 years old, you have to have your high school diploma or GED equivalent, and you have to be excited about teaching children about um, food justice. Um, so if the, we, we see our Service Corps members, should, like most of them are postgraduates, but it's definitely not limited to um, just postgraduates. To follow that up, um, what are some of the qualities you think programs are looking for in their applicants? I think there's um, like a willingness to sort of jump right in, right? And do what it takes to make things work and make things happen while also balancing that with being humble and realizing that you're new on the scene and there's a lot to learn um, about the field, about wherever you are. And so being able to balance that, like, yes, I'm ready to jump in and take initiative and do things and learn from others and like make this all work together. Um, I think that's when I've seen folks be most successful, both in organizations and like in a school or a Teach for America type setting. Couple other quick things out there, like leadership, like we talked about, people step, you know, some demonstration that you're trying to step up and take on more responsibility, the, the kind of responsibility that I guess would potentially qualify you to watch 100 eighth graders at some point on your own. Uh, I think, um, you know, some, some, some demonstration of like passion for the work that you're entering, that it's not just a job that you are trying to get because, you know, options are limited right now, um, that this is something you really care about um, because it's gonna be really hard work and they want people who are gonna stick with it. Uh, and then I think, but you know, this is probably applicable for a lot of nonprofit work and social justice related work, but I think an appetite to, to and an un, like a willingness to grapple with, and, I, and I'm speaking of this particularly as a, as a white person, like to grapple with the dynamics of like race and class and inequity um, and not, and, and coming with a humility, right? That I am not a, a completely woke person who has this all figured out, but that I'm somewhere on my journey and I'm willing to get better and because this is really important. Uh, the, 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 you know, the, the racial inequities that we have in this country uh, and the educational inequities um, uh, are, are, are overlap tremendously for all kinds of reasons. And you have to be somebody um, who is willing to talk about that and dig into it and um, both with others and with yourself. Um, and I think like organizations and programs are looking for that more and more. From my perspective, and this is this is definitely a lot of like personal personal perspective, but um, as someone that is responsible for looking at um, all of the food core applications, the two things that usually stand out for me the most is why is this why is this work important to you personally, and the ability to do that self reflection. Um, you know, what personal experiences have you went through that make you passionate about this work is something that I notice that really um, like makes applications stand out. Um, the other thing that makes applications stand out for me is 
um, you know, thinking about a time when you were navigating a situation that was uncertain and how did you approach that situation in the past? Um, those are the two things that I think make applica applications stand out for me. Could you all take a, take a minute to talk about the benefits a member would receive, like stipends, health insurance, loan deferrals? I can speak to TFA. I mean, every like individual, like the fellowship that I had was just unique and every kind of fellowship like that would be its own thing. Um, in that context, like I said, I had a salary, which I think was actually technically a stipend because I wasn't on as a full-time employee, which is how they got away with not giving me health insurance. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but like Teach for America, you're an employee of the school district. So you get paid whatever a first year teacher in that school district gets paid. You get the same benefits, you get the same retirement benefits, like all of that. You are, you are not an employee of TFA, you're an employee of the district. So whatever those are, are what you get. And then you can also earn an AmeriCorps Education Award. Um, which is an additional stipend of a, I don't remember at this point, it's a couple thousand dollars. Um, and I don't know if there's any others, Tom, those are the ones I remember. Yeah, uh, yeah, I think that's, and I'll just say like, um, although salaries are low, a lot of times the benefits in public school systems are actually really good, uh, pretty good health insurance. Um, and um, yeah, just kind of the uh, the you know, summer's off, I guess you could say, your benefit. Um, yeah, so the like overall benefits of working in schools uh, sometimes are pretty good. Um, for Food Corps, um, the current um, stipend amount is $22,000. Um, and then upon completion of service, um, you are also eligible for the same education award that Jennifer was speaking of. Um, during your time in service, your student loans do go into deferral. Um, that's just subject to your loan, um, your lender approval. Um, we do provide health insurance and partial childcare reimbursements as well. Okay, I think this will be our last question. From what I understand, the current questions are mostly about taking a gap year during the middle of college. However, given the current circumstances, what do you think about incoming freshmen taking a gap year or a gap semester? What, um, what is the deadline for applying for a gap year or semester? Go for it. <laughs> um, I think that there, I, I really do feel like it was helpful for me post-college and just sort of helping to refine, helping to both broaden my perspective and experiences and also refine my interests. And so I think that um, if you're in a position where it makes sense to do that pre-college, I imagine you would reap some of the same benefits. I would totally echo that. I think that if I had done the gap year um, before college, I would have chosen a different major and I would have made my college experience so much more focused. Um, and because I would have had this passion in mind, um, you know, as I was saying before, I was in the healthcare industry for so long. And, and of course, you know, that was very rewarding at the time. But if I had known about, if I had given, if I had been given this lens, um, before college, I could have made my college experience a lot more meaningful. Okay, um, I was just going to briefly say um, I am a junior at Cornell, but I took a gap year um, before I started university. And um, I thought that it was extremely helpful. Um, it helped me like prepare for university more and get in like the mindset of being able to like know what I want to study and find what I'm passionate about. Um, I did some different kind of service opportunities. I worked on farms and I lived in China for a bit. I lived in Ghana for a bit um, and it was an amazing experience and I would recommend it to anyone. So if you are considering it, um, there are many options for you that are still available. Um, and on that note, I would like to thank you all for joining us so much. 
Um, I would like to take a moment to thank all of our speakers for being with us today and sharing their experiences. I think it is very helpful and informative. Um, if anyone has any further questions or wants any further info on gap year opportunities, um, you can feel free to contact the Public Service Center. Um, we are social media is up here um, along with our email and um, our Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. Um, the session will also be recorded and we will be posting the recording and we will also be sending a follow-up email with the panelists contact information if you'd like to get in touch with them and also info about other gap year programs that are available. So thank you guys so much for listening. And I hope you all have a good day. Thank you so much to our panelists. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Have a good afternoon. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. It's great seeing you guys. Thank you for having fun. us. Nice to meet you, Ina. Nice to meet you as well. <laughs> I'll be in touch. Great, great. <laughs> <laughs> Right. You need anything else from us? You want to you know, you're, free, you're free to move on to your weekend now. <laughs> I <laughs> wish. <laughs> I hear stomping above me. I, I know, know. Yeah, I'm, I'm <laughs> excited to see what's behind this door I've closed here. Yeah, I really was. It was awesome. I've been looking forward to this, so this has been lovely. Yeah. Yeah. I know. I'm so great. glad we were able to connect with you and learn about food core. So, yeah, very yeah. nice. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. Hey. Um